trawler men, men of the drifters, fishermen with lines, fishermen of Britain who live in a world all their own, their daily companions, risk, hardship, uncertainty. And yet they have no time or place for grumblers. Where do they search for fish? How do they live? What are their hopes? Their fears, these men who set out in small boats on journeys of anything from 20 miles to 4,000 miles in their search for the living harvest of the sea. Britain has a very varied coastline. Harbors and ports of all shapes and sizes are to be found everywhere. And because of the enormous number of indentations in her coastline, the total length amounts to the astonishing figure of 4,650 miles, a distance greater than the space separating Southampton from Panama. A large part of the destiny of Great Britain and the British people has been shaped by the fishing tradition, which is more than ever alive today, carried on by young fishermen like Ted Lawson. They have learnt their trade. They have been brought up in the tradition of the sea. They know how to make and mend their nets. And one day, they hope to run their own small boats like their fathers and their grandfathers did before them. This is one of the larger fishing ports in England. Along the dockside are the coaling towers that fuel the boats. This factory manufactures the ice that the trawlers stack in their holes for preserving the catch until port is reached again. Year by year, fishing boats are improved. Marketing conditions under government supervision are better than they ever were. But actual fishing methods are not very different from those employed by the apostles Peter, Andrew and James when they lowered their nets into the Sea of Galilee nearly 2,000 years ago. It was a fine and honorable calling then. It is the same today. The gray light of dawn sees the boats preparing to slip away from the fish docks. The unconcern of the men themselves gives the impression they might be going for a half-day pleasure trip instead of a voyage lasting three or four weeks, possibly to battle with some of the worst weather in the world, against mountainous seas, against winds that whine like voices in hell, and with one object, to bring back the fish for the larders of Britain and elsewhere. The sluice gates opening, the boats nose their way slowly and carefully out into the broad expanse of the North Sea. Hour by hour, as the pale morning sun creeps higher into the sky, struggling for existence among a mass of grey cloud, Fishing craft of all types move out to sea. Trawlers, drifters, fishing boats, fishing smacks and fishing schooners, all off on their regular job. And it's worthwhile remembering that if you have to make your living from the sea, the smaller the boat, the bigger the adventure. If there is bad weather ahead, out come well-worn oilskins. The sea can pound good and hard, shaking the boat from stem to stern. The rivets creak and groan. The trawlers pitch fore and aft. These sturdily built boats will steady up into a regular pitch and roll. Nearing the fishing ground, the trawler nets are hoisted and examined for possible breakages. On deck, activity is the keynote. At a command from the skipper, down trawl. The trawling nets are shot over the side, the winches grind out. Down goes the net, down, down to the sea bottom. 50, 60, 70 fathoms below, off on its journey to scrape the ocean bed. Then another shout from the skipper, a clang of the engine room telegraph, and off scampers the trawler through the dark waters, full speed ahead. Nor nor east and a half east, says the skipper. Nor nor east and a half east, repeats the man at the wheel. Just so long as fog and snow keep out of the way, the skipper refuses to be worried. He would sooner fight the most terrific gale than have to navigate in poor visibility. And for that reason, fog and snow are his worst enemies. But tonight, the weather is reasonably fine, and with the green water slipping silently away from the bows, the crew have a chance to take time off for an hour or two's sleep. Most of them turn in in their wet clothes, only stopping to gulp down a mug of steaming tea and chew a hunk of bread and meat. There is a fixed rule. No matter how much a man likes to drink on shore, out of port, not one drop of alcohol is touched by anyone, from skipper to deckhand. 
tea takes its place. And to meet with the men's approval, it must be very hot and sickly sweet. Out of their bunks and once more up on deck, again the winches start to grind. But this time, laboriously, up come the trawling nets, slowly and heavily. The fish pour from the net, covering the deck, overflowing to the scuppers. Silver green cod, red spotted plates, fine turbot, grey green whiting, haddock, skate and silver sole, all very much alive. It is the crew's job to sort out the fish, to gut, to wash and to clean them, ready for lowering into the holes where they are packed and iced. It's no joke gutting live fish with the sea running high and the cold so intense that the knife almost freezes to your fingers. At the skipper's orders, the trawl net is shot every five or six hours until the holes are full. Then, with the catch on board, the race for their home port begins, the race to be first at the markets. In wartime as in peace, by every tide, hundreds of tons of fish are landed at British ports. Sole in place, turbot and cod, haddock, halibut, herring and mackerel, day after day, never failing. Sometimes when they reach their simple homes, dog tired and red-eyed as they are through lack of sleep, a distress call will be sent out. Without hesitation, they pull on their clothes again and man the local lifeboat, ready to risk their lives to save others who may be in danger upon the sea. There is nowhere they won't venture, no task they shirk to help others in danger. And the old men who go no more down to the sea in ships, who in their own language have swallowed the anchor, what do they think of this generation, the men who have taken their places? Dispassionately, they give their considered verdict. It's a hard life they have before them, but they know their job. They're all right. And now that Great Britain, together with her allies, has taken up arms in this, the most desperate conflict of nations ever known, she realizes full well that it is not only in defense of her own freedom she is fighting, but against a very evil thing that is threatening the life of civilization itself. And the British fishing community as in the last great war, is supplying men and boats in the service of their country. Fishing boats are converted into minesweepers, sweeping the seas from the Straits of Dover to the Orkneys, clearing the way for merchant ships, sailing in all weathers through seas alive with mines. And this they are doing with the same cheerful camaraderie that they go about their peacetime occupation. In Britain today, no matter to what class a man belongs, there is an evidence as never before, a quiet determination to crush this war of German aggression, whatever the cost. There is no flag wagging and very little noise. The senior fishermen and the young fishermen like Ted Lawson have one desire, to serve their country as best they can. Men who were the skippers of their own boats are willing to serve and are serving even as deckhands if no other place can be found for them. Today, in some of the smaller villages in Britain, there is a strange quiet. The men folk are away fishing or in the Royal Naval Reserve and Volunteer Reserve. It may be quite a while before the cobblestones will resound again with the clump of their heavy boots. Some will never return. But whatever job they have set their hands to, it will be well done. The strength of the British fisherman lies in his faith, and his faith in the inexhaustible bounty of the sea, and in the steadfastness of a tradition that will not pass away, so long as there is a fishing net to lure and a ship to sail.